During these days, we have concerned ourselves with various aspects of evolution, man evolving, the experiencing self, as well as the setting in which this evolving man must live, his effort to understand the universe, to understand his own uniqueness, not only in relation to nature and to his fellows, but also in, to, in relation to whatever transcendent reality he may confront. We turn now to another aspect of evolution, though a part of the same picture, the evolution of human behavior. And for our guidance in this area, we have been fortunate to secure the services of Dr. S. L. Washburn, Professor of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. Surely by his record and the recognitions that have come to him must be acknowledged as one of the leading anthropologists in this country and perhaps in the world. Graduated from Harvard with his BA and PhD degrees, taught at the Columbia University, University of Chicago, and now the University of California. His field work has been done in numerous parts of the world, including Ceylon and Thailand, Borneo, East Africa, and South Africa. We look forward to what he has to say, coming now with the benefit of what has been said before, which is both an advantage and a uh, disadvantage, I think. But uh, he says he's made some revisions to fit in even more precisely into the context of what's gone on. We welcome him and look forward to his message. The uniqueness of man is the result of the process of evolution. It is evolution which has created a species which is radically different from the other uh, members of the primate order. I want to briefly say a word about evolution, although Professor Dobjansky mentioned this the other day because these points are so important uh, for our subject. Evolution is the change in gene frequencies in populations. It is not a matter of types, or in this sense, of individuals. The success of the populations depends on their behaviors. So if we're considering the way man deviated from certain ape-like ancestors, we are considering the classes of behaviors which slowly differentiated our ancestors, our lineage, from those creatures uh, which continued uh, to be apes. Man did not evolve to his present condition in a uniform or even way. Some parts of us evolve much more rapidly than others. The uniqueness which we've been discussing at this symposium so far is primarily the uniqueness of present day man as compared uh, to animals. In this talk, I want to speak more of the course that, this, uh, that led to this particular kind of, of uniqueness. In the first place, I would point out that man evolved to practically his present morphological state, not completely so, but very nearly so, prior to the world that we think of as normal. Before agriculture, there were only five to 10 million people in the whole world. And you'll see I will use estimates very freely because we do not have uh, firm figures. But rather than the world being a crowded place with three billion people in it, uh, with colleges, with technology, with all the trappings of, of modern life, the world, in contrast, uh, was very empty. The people uh, were living in small groups, frequently very small groups, and they were gathering and hunting 
a very different way of life from what we think of as normal. And yet it was under those conditions which our biology evolved. One of the most remarkable and unique things about man is then that we're living in a setting which is new with a biology which is largely old. Our cultural life has changed so rapidly that biology has had very little chance to catch up and to adjust. Most of the things that we think of as normal are post-agricultural uh, with some, uh, some corrections which I'll make in a minute. The genus that we belong to, the genus Homo, and I'll speak more of this later, 99% um, of the time that this genus has been in existence, our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. Almost all our history then is in the history of small groups of people leading a very tough life. Rough estimate, two-thirds dead before puberty, uh, anyone living beyond 35, an old person. A very, very different kind of expectation then in terms of, of longevity, and I'll come back to the significance of this later on. Yet in a different sense, these hunters and gatherers that we know from a few peoples that are left today and from archaeology, in a different sense, they had all the attributes of man. They were living in complex social systems. They were speaking languages which are just as complex as ours, except that we have more words. Uh, they were living by complex economic systems, uh, kinship, religion, myth, in the sense that Father McMullen used it, not in the derogatory sense, but as those beliefs that make a society possible. They had arts, music, most of the things then that we would think of radically distinguishing man from the animals are in this sense old, thousands of years old. Dr. Drabjanski spoke of the uh, length of time, how far ago that burial practices came in, uh, certainly well over 50,000 uh, years ago. So, the evolution of our species was in accord with these conditions of times long past. But it was an evolution of a rich, complex life. And I may frequently just have to speak, say, of stone tools. In this case, the stone tools are symbolic of a rich uh, human kind of life. What our ancestors did with this social life was to adapt and to adapt very successfully. Because without forming one, more than one species, our ancestors over the last 600,000 years occupied first the old world and then the entire world. So their social life, their economic life, their technical way of life, their myths, this enabled them to be the most successful uh, species uh, of any of the primates. Now, Um, there are two kinds of evidences that we can use in looking back at these times long past. We can use the direct evidence of the fossils, and this is very fragmentary, or we can use the evidence of the behaviors of our nearest living relatives, the apes and the monkeys, and particularly of the uh, chimpanzees. And this is dangerous because these creatures are all alive today. They're not the ancestral forms. Uh, they're descendants of the ancestral forms. But by putting these two lines of evidence together, we may get a better understanding of our ancestors and our own uniqueness uh, than in other ways. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of how this works before going into the story in more detail. If we look either at the behavior of the contemporary apes and monkeys and compare them to ourselves or at the actual fossil record, we find that we differ in quite surprising ways that were not anticipated by people who were simply speculating on how we differ uh, from the other primates. Uh, for example, our whole notion of space is completely different from that of the non-human primates. Most monkeys spend their entire lives in a matter of two or three square miles. The gorilla spends its life in about 15 square miles, according uh, to Schaller. Here then are animals who are 
can move much more rapidly than we can, good locomotor system, their special senses are very similar to ours, but they live their entire life in this exceedingly small area. Uh, this is not even a problem that's just discussed in, in the literature. One would think one could drive monkeys along very easily. Uh, Ronald Hall, the late Ronald Hall tried this. He tried driving baboons and it's very easy. The troop runs along ahead of you until they reach the end of the area that they know. And then you try to drive them and the first thing you know the troop has all worked around you and gone back the other way. And they will not go beyond this, this space that they know. So one thing that is really remarkable about man is that even the most primitive men operate over hundreds of square miles uh, rather than these uh, small areas. Something then that looks quite different after we examine the behavior on the prime, uh, non-human primates. Uh, the density of human populations is held up as remarkable. But many monkeys reach densities of well over 100 animals per square mile and some to 300 per square mile in one species with more than one species in the area. So density is much less distinctive of man than this question of area. Uh, death was discussed. Uh, and uh, when you watch these free-ranging monkeys, uh, you see sick animals, injured animals, and you see the attitude of the animals in the troop to the sick and to the injured and to death. Um, in general, one can put it this way, that as long as an infant monkey should be riding on its mother, whether it is injured or even dead, its mother will continue to carry it. And if she stops carrying it, uh, an adult male is likely to go to her and to bark at her, and in this sense to make it clear that she should continue uh, carrying the infant. We've had one case in our small colony at Berkeley where a mother carried her dead infant for two days and dropped it, and then the dominant adult male of the troop picked the infant up and carried it for two more days uh, before discarding it. And in other words, uh, all through this time, he showed uh, tension, uh, I almost say a experiencing self. Um, <laughs> this animal then was greatly concerned that he showed by a wide variety of actions uh, with, with this dead uh, infant. Uh, if on the other hand, the injured animal or the dead animal is adult or even half grown, it now then would no normally never ride on another member of the troop, and it is then simply left. Um, what you see in Africa is a troop of the monkeys going along, and in this troop or lagging behind the troop will be an animal with a broken leg, and the leg is just flopping uselessly. It must continue with the troop. If it stays behind, it will probably be taken by a predator and die. You see animals which are just dragging themselves along. They're so sick that as soon as the troop stops moving, a sick animal just drops down on his side, uh, panting and stays there until the troop starts again and pulls himself up and uh, walks along uh, with the troop. Uh, to stay in the troop is then literally a matter of life and death uh, to, to these animals. But the injured animal, say, after this very uh, young state, receives no help uh, from other members of the troop. Um, why do they have to stay with a the troop? They have to stay with a troop because all these troops are migratory. They're not going back to any one fixed location. So there's no way for a sick animal to stay someplace with any assurance that the troop would come back uh, to where he is. Again, this comes uh, from the field studies. Uh, there is no place, no home base, where an animal can be sick and where another animal might bring it food or take care of it. There is no food sharing in the non-human primates except between mother and nursing young and a small amount with chimpanzees. And you notice I will repeatedly mention chimpanzees as exceptions to generalizations because of the non-human primates, as we know through the work of Jane Goodall, uh, they are the closest to, to us in behavior as they are in biochemistry and chromosomes and anatomy and, and many other uh, features. Um, we think it natural to have a home base. We think it natural that when you're sick, somebody uh, will come and bring you food. And this, of course, changed the whole course of disease, the relation of evolution to disease, because we do not have to be as completely adapted to local conditions as the monkeys do. A lethal disease for free-ranging monkeys or a lethal injury 
is one that separates the animal from the true. If you put it in, in terms of your own life, you should have been able to reach this state to walk at least five miles per day every day of your life, regardless of sickness, injury, or any other consideration. And if you couldn't do that under these conditions, you would be dead. This sense, man offers a kind of care to other members uh, which is entirely uh, unique. So I think it's worthwhile to, to look at these behaviors of the contemporary forms and compare them to those of man. Now the fossil record I think is almost equally surprising or more surprising because there were many ideas of what was going to be found when the missing links were found. And as Dr. Dobjansky said, many missing links have now been found. Of course, we always want more. But the important thing to realize is that they don't look like what they were supposed to. We've discussed a lot about the brain in this symposium, but the part of our body which first, from an evolutionary point of view, looks fully human, as the part of it that reached practically its present state first, is the foot. There is a foot. Uh, roughly two million years old from Alderway Gorge, is also mentioned by Dr. Dobjansky. And this foot is so human in its morphology that when it, when it was passed around a conference of international specialists, uh, nobody looked at it practically. They just passed it to the next person. Well, now when a fossil gets passed around that is really substantially new and different, each scientist goes to hang on to it as long as he reasonably can and has a really good look at it. In the sense in this foot, there's just nothing to look at. It's, it's a human foot, although it is two million years old. The brain, that is the, the size of the brain, as reflected in the bones of this same creature, is no larger than that of a contemporary ape. Um, at least nine-tenths of the time that our lineage has been separated from that of the apes, for at least nine-tenths of this time, and probably much more than that, the brains of our ancestors were no larger than the brains of the apes. And the reason that the human brain, from an evolutionary point of view, the reason that the human brain makes human behavior possible is that the human brain evolved in response to the success of the human way of life. The brain then and the way of life evolved together and evolved exceedingly late in our evolutionary history. Now let's think of this uh, fossil record a bit more and the kind of creature that this earliest man uh, actually is. Uh, he is, shares many characteristics with ourselves. For example, they had small canine teeth, as we do. A tooth up here. If you look at a dog or a monkey or whatnot, you find that the upper teeth here are, are very large. But in this fossil of roughly two million years ago, these teeth are hardly larger than they are in ourselves. The foot, as I said, is practically human, and the leg from very fragmentary remains is mostly human. From the waist down then, uh, these creatures were uh, very human. Um, the teeth were very human, except the molar teeth were very large. They made stone tools, another human uh, characteristic, and the main site where the best uh, documented ones have been found by Dr. Leakey at Alderway Gorge. Here are the bones of the creature, the bones of the animals that it presumably killed, and the stone tools are all found uh, together. But the hand that held these tools is a hand that is almost diagrammatically halfway between the hand of an ape and the hand of man. The hand then, you see, is strikingly different from the foot. And the suggestion here is that the large thumb, the characteristic of the human hand, evolved long after the hand was used for holding and making tools and evolved in response to the new selection pressures that came with the success of this tool-making uh, way of life. When you look at your hand then, you are looking at the result of a couple of million years of tool use, is putting this uh, from an evolutionary point of view. Now, how remarkable is this tool using? As um, Dr. Thorpe mentioned, chimpanzees uh, do use tools 
and aside from man, they are the most skillful tool users uh, in the primates. More importantly than just trimming a, a little stick or something like this, chimpanzees use a tool, tools for a wide variety of reasons. They clean themselves with leaves, for example, and it's very hard to find evidences of any cosmetic care in the non-human primates. The uh, chimpanzees use throw stones. Uh, they uh, pull branches off and use them sort of as pseudo clubs. They wave around with them. Uh, they put sticks uh, to get honey into a bee's nest. Uh, they get ants and termites with different kinds of tools. Now let's just consider that stone throwing for a minute. Um, if a chimpanzee throws a stone, it picks up any stone that's handsy and it throws it. And you can generalize from all the cases the bit seen, they don't hit the thing they throw the stone at. And if they take a, off a branch from a tree and they use this as a club and they swing it around, they don't hit, with, now with a couple of exceptions, the thing they're swinging the branch at. So there are two very different kinds of routes to tool using that we didn't understand before the field studies. One route to tool using is directly utilitarian, which we think of normally. The other route to tool using is agonistic display. The animal is waving the grass around, bush around, a branch around. Uh, the hair in its neck is all standing up like this. It's jumping up and down, and it's whooping, and it's using the object to scare off uh, the person that it's bluffing against. And when it throws the stone, there's no indication it really intends, or really expects, I should say, uh, to hit the object that it's throwing the stone at. Now, in contrast to this, Human tool use is skillful. And the skill of human tool use involves changes in the brain. It involves the fact that man can easily learn to use tools and can easily learn to be skillful in a way that the ape cannot. It is not then that there's an instinct for tool use built into the brain. But there is structure in the brain which makes learning to use objects almost inevitable for man. To be skillful in object use, as we all know, in this sense, you need to be human, you need to have the large brain, you need to play with the objects when you're young so that the skills are developed, and the play needs to be rewarded by society. You cannot then view efficient tool use simply as a question of picking up an isolated stone and throwing it. There's much more to human tool use than that. We all take it for granted that if a kid is going to throw a baseball well, he's going to put a great deal of time into throw the base, throwing the baseball, and that he will do this because he's going to get social reward, that his friends are going to say, well, you're the best, you know, you can be the pitcher, or you can be on first base, or whatever this social reward may be. Constant practice is a characteristic of human play, and it's not a characteristic of the play of the non-human primates. So when we think of origin of tool use, we're concerned with play, with practice, with social reward, as well as just uh, the stone or the object which is found. Now, if we look at tools in this regard, and think now of these earliest stone tools, more or less two million years ago, and probably uh, for a million years more than that, there's fair evidence for this, at least a million years more. If we think of these earliest tools, three quarters of them are unshaped stones. They've been carried in, but they're just plain stones that haven't been shaped at all. The others have a flake or two taken off them, and this doesn't require much skill. These are the tools that are associated with these small-brained earliest ancestors. Let me give you an example of how much skill this takes. Uh, Dr. Desmond Clark at, at Berkeley runs an archaeological laboratory. And in order to get the students to appreciate the problems of early man, he imports lots of stones and lets the students uh, make them. Now, in the first afternoon, a reasonably intelligent graduate student can learn to make this kind of, of tool. It's just a matter, then, of, 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 of hours work. Of course, you're given the stone, you're told how to do it, but it's, it's very simple. And it could easily be learned by copying. I don't think this involves any use of language or anything like that. But the next level of stone tools, the complex tools, 
which are found with large brain men starting about 600,000 years ago, no student has yet succeeded in making one of these in a one semester course. <laughs> given the material, given the object to copy, having a professor tell you how to do it, and Clark, by the way, is pretty good at this. He's almost Neanderthal. Um, <laughs> It still takes much more practice than you can put in, in in a reasonable semester. People now who really put a lot of time into this do this just as well uh, as the ancient men did. But it, it takes a great deal of time and skill. So this then, a tool which takes this sort of time and skill is made only by large brain creatures, not by this sort of person uh, that I described first. Along with these large brain creatures, this is the beginning now of the genus Homo, Java man, Peking man, and so on, comes other characteristics that we think of as human. Hunting large animals, and we think this means cooperation probably and division of labor, moving long distances, not the small range. This is shown both by the animals hunted and by the fact that the, the material in many of these tools is moved for miles, long, long, really long distances, and fire, at least in the case of some of these creatures. So in terms of complex tools, large brains, hunting large animals, and fire, uh, we have an ancestry of about 600,000 years. Our separation from the apes is at least five million years ago, and probably considerably more than that. So complex tool use, large brain, hunting, these things, again, are late in human history from an evolutionary point of view. And we see the problem of learning to use tools, perhaps most clearly, if we think of the primates as a whole. Here's an order, then, which, with many families, dozens of genera, hundreds of species, all these animals had good grasping hands, and in 50 million years of time, only one of these becomes a tool user. The problem here, then, is a great problem from a biological point of view. And there's all kinds of parallelism in the primates. Many elaborate different locomotor systems developed in parallel in different lines. Many characteristics of the brain evolved in parallel in different lines. Same is true of many characters of locomotion. But tool using evolved only once. And we believe that this is because a special is a special development from the knuckle-walking African apes. And it is intimately related to this peculiar way where the ape walks on his knuckles like this with instead of his feet down. And the animals that walk with their feet flat can't become tool users in this sense because every time they put their foot down, they build a psychological block, so to speak, against tool using. The animal that puts his feet uh, like this can carry the tool uh, even if he's walking quadrupedally. We don't really see then the problem of becoming unique in this human way unless we look at the fossils and unless we look at the behavior of the, of the contemporary apes. Another problem that we've considered a lot in this symposium, and I agree with the other speakers of its importance, is the question of language. Now, if you stop to think about it, it's even more remarkable that language hasn't developed several times. Because when we consider tool use, it's obvious why animals with hoofs and claws and things like this can't evolve elaborate repertoire of tool use, because uh, wh how could you do it with a, with a hoof, so to speak? So we're limited to the primates with their hands to start with. But uh, all the mammals make sounds, and uh, it would seem to be so advantageous to develop a language that it's really, it seems to me, very surprising uh, that language also has apparently only developed once. Now, what I'd like to do is describe to you briefly the communication system of monkeys so you'll see what the problem is of changing this kind of a communication system into a system of language. What does a monkey communicate, and how does he communicate? He primarily communicates emotional states which are important in social situations. That's 95%, at least, of what is being communicated. The message, then, is 
The two animals are in sight of each other, or the, whatever animals are, are interacting in this. The message is given by facial expression, by hair, which may stand up, by posture, by the position of the tail, by many characteristics you see, which may or may not be emphasized by sound. Sound then is usually a quite unimportant part of the repertoire. And if you want to take the trouble to play back sounds to monkeys or to learn to make the sounds uh, yourself, uh, you'll find that it's very difficult uh, to get much response from monkeys. Some sounds they will respond to. I'll tell you what those are uh, in a second. But even as different as our faces are from those of a baboon, at least we hope they are, uh, you can easily learn to make a threat gesture with your face that a baboon who's not responded to a human face threat gesture before will immediately respond to. All you have to do is to raise your eyebrows, lower your head, bob your head, and you get your complete attack back uh, from, the, from the baboon. <laughs> In other words, he knows that these gestures mean threat and he's not going to let you get away with it. But it's very difficult to get a response by sound. Where you can get a response by sound without gesture are warning of predators, and there are frequently two sounds for this, a, 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 a ground predator and an arboreal predator. We'll have different sounds. Chickens have that. I mean, that's not an elaborate kind of communication. And the other sound is when an animal is, is separated from the troop, and it now has got to locate the troop. So it makes a location noise, and the, the, the lo location noise is then answered by an animal in the troop. And see here, there must be an auditory only communication uh, for it to function. But aside from that, most of these sounds are, uh, say, going along with gesture. Um, for example, some of these sounds have been described as, as uh, food noises, designating where food are. Well, what these noises really are is just I'm feeling good noises. And I'm feeling good noises may come when I'm eating food or they may come under other circumstances, but they indicate well-being, which is very likely to attract other monkeys uh, into the location of, of this well-being uh, kind of noise, you see. It's not then a designation of food as such. Now, what human language does in its simplest form is to name something in the environment. And this is precisely what monkey sounds and gestures do not do. Uh, they may warn of a predator, but they can't say lion, they can't say hyena, they can't say leopard. And this would seem to be of supreme adaptive value. This is why I think it's so surprising that this happened more often, because what the animals in fact have to do is quite different with these different forms of predators. Uh, for example, if baboons give a warning bark, the essence of the bark is, look at me. And the meaning of the bark comes from what I am doing after I gave the bark. And we are first we're recording these sounds. We had uh, bark means stay where you are, bark means run away, bark means all kinds of different things. Until we saw that if it was a dominant male who gave a warning bark and started to run away, the whole troop ran just as fast as it could go. But if it was a young juvenile who was just practicing warning barks for the fun of it, so to speak, uh, this would have no effect whatsoever <laughs> on the other members of the troop. So the problem in the origin of language is the problem of relating sounds to specific items in the environment. And Geshwin and Lancaster, I think, first uh, really clarified uh, this sort of a problem. Uh, now you'll see what I'm getting at. If you remember the, the slide which uh, Sir John Eccles showed of the large areas of the brain which are concerned with language, and these are very large areas indeed, uh, that these areas must be late in human evolution uh, because language is late in human evolution. There's no space in the brain, so to speak, of these early fossils uh, for, for language. So there were some million years of tool use prior to the origin of environmental reference. And what we think that the origin of language comes from the specificity, specific interest in environmental items that comes in after tool use. And this so that it's the skill in tool use is also related ultimately to language. Nobody has yet found a way of, of uh, get diagnosing language in the fossils, so uh, when it came in uh, is not known. 
There are three rates of evolution, though, which I would like to call to your attention. The earliest rate is with these small-brained creatures, Australopithecus, man-apes, whatever you want to call them. There, there is almost no change in tool type for a minimum of a million years, and probably at least twice that. This is non-human, you see. This is, is hard for us to imagine using tools for this period of time and not improving them. The second rate comes with Homo erectus, the men from about 600,000 years ago down to more or less uh, 50,000 years ago, to Homo erectus into the early Homo sapiens. Here there is change in the tools. They evolve, but they evolve at an incredibly slow rate. And you can find the same kind of tool, for example, in England and Europe, uh, the Near East, Africa, and India. And this same kind of tool lasting for a couple of hundred thousand years. See, this is a very different thing from what we think of as normal in terms of change. Then when Homo sapiens sapiens is on the scene, tools change at a tremendous rate. And everywhere you look, so to speak, in the archaeological record, there are different kinds of tools, geographical variation, and rapid change. And in, from an evolutionary point of view, very few thousand years now, uh, uh, agriculture comes. In terms of language, it is interesting that the linguist Morris Swadesh, who unfortunately died earlier this year, suggested on the basis of linguistic evidence that the languages of Homo sapiens sapiens, our languages, have an antiquity of about 40,000 years. And working from the linguistic evidence entirely independently, he reached a figure that corresponds with the archaeological change and with the change in, in the, the uh, rate of physical evolution. So although we, we don't know it, and everything in evolution is very, very speculative, everything in this uh, field, or I better say racket, is speculative, um, um, uh, it is striking, I think, that the notion that the very, very effective languages that we have today, which all people have today, that this has an antiquity of something on the order of 40,000 years. With complex society, and I think complex society is only possible with at least some linguistic uh, communication, with complex society, there are other biological changes uh, which are essential and which are easy to forget. And these are also ways in which we are unique. For example, take the control of emotion and the control of rage. Uh, if one watches uh, free-ranging monkeys or uses uh, Goodall's excellent data on chimpanzees, and she's been most generous with this, uh, letting us see her motion pictures and showing us unpublished material, and I certainly want to, want to uh, publicly thank her uh, for this. If one uh, sees this sort of thing, one characteristic thing is these big male chimpanzees just going into uncontrollable rages. Uh, uh, this is characteristic of, of many monkeys, too. Uh, you couldn't have a group of, of apes or monkeys sitting around as you people are sitting around for any substantial period of time. Somebody would get mad at somebody and the thing would go whammo. <laughs> so the shift of rage, of course rage is, is a chemical matter, a matter of the brain and so on, as, as well as, as a social matter that, that triggers it off. Uh, our brains are vastly more in control of the rage reactions than is the case in the non-human primates. And certainly this is related to the ability to cooperate and to plan. These abilities also, of course, are uniquely human. Um, let me speak of cooperation for a minute. It seems so obvious to us that it is so easy to learn to cooperate with three other, four other people when it's the benefit of all concerned that this doesn't seem to be a problem. But for the non-human primates, to get two animals to do something for mutual benefit is about the limit of, of cooperation. It's exceedingly difficult to either observe under field conditions or create under laboratory conditions uh, any kind of what from a human standpoint would seem to be a minimum amount of, of cooperation. Um, in the politics of a baboon troop, for example, the, the, the troop depends on, a, has a dominance hierarchy. There's an animal at the top, I'll mention this later, and uh, uh, he may be supported by one or two allies. 
other words, up to three animals may cooperate in maintaining the political structure of the troop. The communist is one in control, uh, sometimes two, and rarely three. And that's the limit of the political structure in size. In other words, just about as minimal uh, as you can get. Uh, sex is also remarkably different uh, in human beings than in the non-human primates. In, I say non-human primates, I should have mentioned, I'm restricting this to old world monkeys and apes, and obviously to the ones where we have some field studies. In these forms, the female runs regular cycles and goes into heat, into estrus, for a relatively short time in each month. Uh, during this period, when the female is actively soliciting sex, it up, she upsets the social relationships in the troop. She is a major, then, disruptive force of orderly social relations. It has been uh, stated that the, the um, uh, continuing receptivity in the human female is one way of keeping, supporting the family and so on, and I suppose it has this function too. But from our field studies, we think that the main thing is to get rid of the terrifically disruptive function of females going into heat. Because when females uh, go into heat, uh, the males may compete for these females. They're very frequently fights. Uh, Don Said has been studying the rhesus monkeys, and, and the frequency of fighting just goes right up in the breeding season and drops out uh, after the breeding season. So that directly the female in estrus is disruptive, and indirectly she's disruptive by uh, causing all the infighting uh, within the troop. So uh, the loss of this kind of uncontrollable sex drive is exceedingly important. And Frank Beach pointed out years ago that this is due to the human brain being far more important in sexual behavior than is the case in the non-human primates. Um, if we um, consider now a few problems which come from uh, human evolution, um, there are a few general topics uh, which I would like uh, to mention. Uh, first, I'd like to stress though that one wants to think of, of the, what evolved is the species. And what is in this human species is the ability to adapt through its social system and its technology to a very wide variety of local environments and to adapt through its language, through its myth, through its religion, through its art and so on, uh, again, to a very wide variety of social environments. So we're dealing with a highly successful highly adaptable, very special kind of a creature which through evolution has become very different uh, from the ancestral species. But we evolved in these times long past. So the feedback between the society of man and the evolution of man was in terms of conditions which have ceased to exist. And what I would like to suggest to you is that a set of the problems which face us today are more understandable if we see these peculiarities of human nature which were adaptive in times past and are not adaptive at, at time today. In each of these instances, I want to point out that what we're concerned with is ease of learning and the modification of learning by social institutions point out in terms of evolution of the tools. What happens is ultimately the tool use becomes completely easy to learn, although initially it was almost impossible to learn and later difficult. Let us consider space, which I've mentioned before. In this large human space occupied by the hunters and gatherers, some hundreds of square miles, the tribes concerned know the whole space. They know their area, uh, normally resent other people coming into this area. The area has emotional, immediate emotional importance to the people who are living there. Now, space has just completely changed uh, in these regards. Mankind is now moving all over the world. If you fly across a country, you do not have a knowledge of the area that you've passed across. You do not have in the same sense emotional attachment to the area. Um, if you read back in, in literature, as we were advised to do yesterday, in poetry and so on, 
you'll see repeatedly space is referred to in terms of these high emotional values. Is there a man with soul so dead who never to himself hath said, this is mine own, uh, my native land? Uh, space then was, in the terms of the small, compact area, a matter of immediate emotional concern and was frequently uh, defended. Time is again a dimension of life which was very different, so to speak. I've mentioned that most people died very early. There wasn't any evolution then, any biological evolution, to make it easy to appreciate long intervals of time. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. If you knew you were in great danger right now, you'd be worried. Uh, if you thought that you were going to be in danger tomorrow, uh, you might be worried. Uh, the fact that cigarettes may be going to kill you some years hence is a matter of no concern to most people who are smoking cigarettes. Uh, the possibility then of the danger is sufficiently removed in time so it isn't real in this sense to an organism who has not evolved to feel strongly about 20 years hence or 30 years hence. Uh, life insurance schemes and so on uh, have to be made compulsory because the average person, again, doesn't have any biology which leads him to worry about times long hence. What if our ancestors had worried about times long hence? They would have quit. What was sure going to happen that they were going to be killed, and they were going to be killed when they were pretty young, or going to die of disease when they were pretty young. It was highly adaptive for these creatures not to consider distant places or distant times. And we still have uh, these characteristics. Along with this, is, again, this is how you treat it, get along in a tough world, is people are very optimistic. And we all are optimistic. And this is what Las Vegas lives on. Here you have a machine which you know is only going to pay back, say, 40% of what goes into it. But the 40% that it pays back is so satisfying to the person that gets it that they'll go right along uh, losing the 60%. Uh, if one of our ancestors, so to speak, had really bet on his chances for living, he would have just have quit. Emotion is also a biological problem. I've mentioned it before in terms of, of rage and sex, but of course there's, there's much more emotion to that, to emotion than that. We have been evolved to feel strongly for a very small number of people. And that's all there were to feel strongly for in time past. To see the species that was evolving uh, with groups of 20, groups of 50, this sort of order, these were relatives, these were the close people, these were the important people, these were people you could sacrifice for and feel strongly that this was uh, the proper thing to do. Here we're in a world that's packed full of people who aren't relatives, who don't have these attributes at all, and yet we are supposed to, to act uh, for them. Um, one way you'll find repeatedly to try to take these emotions from the small group and shift them to the large is use the vocabulary of the small group. You speak of neighbor, you speak of brother, you don't speak of, of, of mankind. If you want to de-emphasize the group, you speak of communist. You use some uh, word like this which puts people out of the human category insofar uh, as you can do it. The problem that the social reformer change, uh, okay, when you want to get action, you need emotion. The problem is to educate so that these emotions can now be felt about a group of people uh, of a size, of a distance, and so on, uh, that there never is any biological background for feeling in this way. Um, Shakespeare has um, Henry V uh, say, he's now in France, it's the night before battle, uh, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. They weren't few, they weren't happy, and they weren't brothers. See, this, this is the, to, to bring this situation back into where it's emotionally loaded, feasible, small group uh, kind of a situation. This is repeatedly then uh, what uh, we find uh, people doing. So this poses problems because we want people to deal with the whole world 
with distant places, distant times, and with people to whom they are not related and they don't feel emotionally uh, strongly. Then on top of this biology then, one has to have education, and I think the education can be done more effectively if we understand some of these limitations of the biology. You easily learn then to feel strongly about only a few people, and this then requires extension. Another thing which evolutionists build into us, came up yesterday, is that we easily learn to be aggressive. The way of life of our ancestors was not an easy life. And if you think of this time before agriculture and even a great deal after it, the group was defended by the young adult males who hunted and formed the army. The order of killing is very high. Uh, Frank Livingston has estimated that in many uh, primitive uh, tribes, the order of males killed in combat is about 25%. See, this again is taking place in a very small number of years, from about 18 uh, to 31 or two, when people get classified as old and out of the army, in primitive society at least. Uh, consider, for example, hunting. Uh, it is extraordinary, if you stop to think of it, how readily our country takes to the notion to spend millions and millions of dollars of raising fish so that people can have the pleasure of killing the fish uh, with a small line uh, in the summertime. Think of the millions of dollars that were spent on raising pheasants and raising deer and so on for hunters to have, in quotes, the sport of killing prior to the issue of improving the ghettos in our cities. Here you see a simple indication of what it's very easy for human beings to think of as normal. I suggest to you that history has been expurgated almost beyond belief because nowadays we do not like to read about what our ancestors did and what was done until very recent time. War was eulogized to be a real man, was to be a soldier, and torture uh, was the norm uh, over most of the world. A person cannot go out and enjoy hunting and enjoy this kind of primitive warfare unless he can easily learn to be aggressive and take pleasure in these kind of actions. This does not mean that we have to continue to be aggressive. As I've pointed out always, there's biology and then there is learning. But what this does show is that the second the institutional controls are taken off, you will have a Congo, you will have an Algeria, you will have a concentration camp because there's nothing within our species as such in the biology which makes people revolted by these things. What keeps mankind under control then is human institutions. And one of the problems with war is that we do not have different institutions from those that were going when war was an accepted instrument of the policy of practically every nation. Let me speak briefly of dominance. Dominance is a very fundamental uh, character in the behavior of the non-human primates. I've mentioned this uh, before. The, it certainly was true also in these small tribes. People wanted the great leader, the hero, the war leader, the medicine man, and uh, these roles were frequently won. But this primate dominance has several peculiarities which I would like to call to your attention. Dominance orders the true, but it is not enough for the dominant animal to have food, sex, grooming, and all the rewards that may come uh, to a monkey. In addition to this, the essence of dominance is that the other adult males are down. It's not then just a question of rewarding, it's a question that the, other are, that the others are down. Uh, today we call this uh, uh, man continuing maintaining a dominance position saving face. This is a very uh, similar uh, concept. One of the aspects of dominance is to allow lesser creatures to fight or not at the wishes of the dominant creature. And again, if you look at the newspapers today, you repeatedly find the notion that the dominant nations are concerned whether the small nations are fighting or not fighting. 
And I suggest this is a very basic uh, part of general primate biology. Finally, I'd like to say that in this primitive society, the tendency is to look for simple causes, personal causes, immediate causes, and to see the world in these terms. Today we get this people uh, speaking of President Johnson's war as if one man uh, was in control of the situation. And it is very difficult for our kind of biology to appreciate realities which are complex, which are multiple, which cover large areas with many causes and long term. And several speakers have mentioned computers before. And my own belief is that the world is so complex that computers must be programmed so that people have some chance of seeing the reality of situations and getting these brought back to a level where these primitive human minds uh, can deal with it. I would like to make, in closing, uh, one last point um, on education. What have we been told relative to the diversity of man? Dr. Jodzanski has, has pointed out the tremendous genetic diversity of man. From the evolutionary point of view, one sees this enormous diversity of, of primitive cultures. Certainly, every individual is unique. We've been, been uh, told about that. Uh, how does education, then, uh, fit into this kind of a picture? Our intelligence, then, is the result of evolution. It is composed of many different skills. We need social skills, skills of art, skills of music, a vast range of different skills. And yet, these are all channeled through pencil and paper tests and things like the IQ. And it is a desecration of the human individual to suppose that he can be placed in a complex social system with a test of this nature. This is essentially throwing away our entire understanding of the possibility of man and channeling it through verbal and minor mathematical ability. If there's anything in the view of evolution I've been presenting, it's that there should be a much wider range of opportunity in the schools, many more channels, many more social kinds of encouragement. Because the kind of creature that we are has many different sorts of possibilities in its biology, and these can only be developed by a wide variety of social encouragements and different social situations. Well, seem to have lots of questions here. And uh, is there such a thing as spiritual and mental evolution, just as there has been physical and, and social evolution? Well, th there's certainly mental evolution. I mean, the difference between something like a chimpanzee or these early small brain fossils and ourselves is, is tremendous. And this certainly involves uh, the mind, and it needs to mean any reasonable way. The problem with spiritual is what what do you mean and what can you find in, in the record? And uh, um, on this, I might say that the, the problem of, of talking about, uh, I mean, we introspect in ourselves, we then assume that the rest of the people, as said before, have the same kind of internal workings and so on as, as, as we do. Now, obviously, if you look at a monkey, you don't then assume that this creature is constructed in the, in the same way that you are. And when you watch their behaviors, uh, you're sure, uh, sure that they're not. But I think they have self-evaluation. And there's some experiments that suggest this, so that the difference may be l quantitatively very large, but not complete. Uh, for example, Delgado was stimulated in a monkey brain with a telemetry device. And this stimulation, the, the, the electrode, is so located that the monkey attacks. And this is a simple thing. You stimulate the monkey, the monkey attacks. OK, now put four monkeys together. And they're in a hierarchy, one, two, three, four. 
Now all these monkeys can be stimulated to attack. Stimulate the number one, the dominant animal, it attacks because it knows it's going to get away with it. You're precisely the same physiological stimulation in the, in the most subordinate animal, and he cowers in the corner of the cage. He's upset, but he knows he can't attack these other monkeys, and so he appraises the situation and, and goes off. Now, I think he has some concept of self. He has a very clear realization of what his relation to these uh, other animals are. Isn't it true that since thought appeared on the earth in man, there's been no major or like evolutionary change. How, if this is true, is it, is it significant? Well, uh, other animals think. I, I don't really understand the question. I, I, I think what's happened is that man is now so dominant through his technology that he is, is stopping the evolution of many other animals, not insects and things like this, which developing new strains versus DDT and so on. But, uh, Man is, is stopping the evolution of many other kinds of creatures just by blotting them out. You speak of the primitive human mind which makes for difficulties in the modern world. You envision the evolution of a more superior mind uh, in the future. Well, uh, maybe I'm optimistic. I don't worry about the long-term future. I worry about the immediate future. And what, evo uh, what evolution might ultimately do to the mind, I think, is, is not our problem. We've got to, to live right now, and we've got to meet the problems of the next hundred years. Now, I think it's clear that, say, in the problems of the next hundred years, that evolution is not going to produce a mind that's going to be uh, substantially different from those that are available at the present time. This doesn't mean that evolution isn't continuing. It is. But um, it's continuing under very new and very different conditions. Do you predict that man will continue to educate man to be aggressive so that war will continue to be accepted aspect of social behavior? Well, let, let me speak of the difference of an education, say, of an Aleut and an American in this regard. Um, an Aleut boy, this is Bill Laughlin's data, has got to learn to throw a harpoon from a kayak. And this is anatomically impossible for us. To sit with your legs straight out and then to throw with tremendous force and so on means that the child has to start to learn this when he's a kid. And so his father or some other relative uh, helps him to do this when he's a child and he practices and practices. He knows that it's terribly important. He sees his father do it. He has every possible motivation to become the best spear thrower from a kayak uh, you see that's around. He can see the objective, he recognizes that it's important, and he has every kind of possible reward uh, for doing this thing right. Now, if you look what happens in America today, the child cannot see the objective. And the objectives, even if you can see them, are ambiguous. The real dilemma is, are we educating people for war or for peace? And the thing is, some people are doing one thing and some people are doing another. And this is what is fundamentally frustrating, and this is what is contrary uh, to the basic bi biology of the situation. Uh, to get the maximum of education, a person should play at the job, he should be socially rewarded, he should clearly see what the ultimate objective is. And if it's an intermediate stage in the education, then it ought to be made clear uh, how, how this in intermediate stage uh, fits into an ultimate goal. But our country's not agreed on the ultimate goals. And until one can be agreed on the behaviors which are appropriate for the ultimate goals, there will be great frustration in any educational system. Some hold that man was a peaceful vegetarian, <coughs> food gatherer, uh, something, till climatic changes forced him to become a hunter and carnivorous, this lady leading to the development of hostility. Could a man have evolved from food gathering and agriculture without going through a hunting stage? Well, well I suppose he might have. He didn't. I mean, it's, uh, the fact is that, see, for 600,000 years, roughly, and along with the bones of our ancestors, or the bones of elephants and deer and all kinds of large creatures uh, which they killed, whatever might have happened, this is not uh, what actually happened. And the notion that agricultural people are peaceful, of course, is, is a phony notion. 
some, one of the most aggressive of the primates are baboons, which are vegetarians, and these, these are exceedingly aggressive by any kind of, of normal standards of aggression. And if you look back again at the uh, history of the Roman Empire, which after all was an agricultural empire, and you look what they did, uh, I think you'll see it was a pretty aggressive organization. Uh, this is on Ardry and the territorial imperative. I'm used to this question. It's, it's one we pretty well all, always get. Uh, I think you want to look at the Ardry book, uh, essentially for, uh, in terms of Ardry. Ardry is a dramatist. Uh, he wrote a book for sales. He's a good writer. It's a well-written book. It's a persuasive book. He greatly overstates a particular line and greatly overstates it and there isn't any territorial imperative uh, in his sense. And he overstated it deliberately. A friend of mine, Ray Carpenter, who did the work on the Howler Monkeys, uh, read the territorial imperative in, in manuscript and, and uh, talked to Ardry about it and said, you know, I mean, uh, you know it's way overstated. Why don't you uh, get this down where it has some relation uh, to the facts? And Ardry said, you're the professor. He said, my job is to sell this book. And this, I think, explains a lot. <laughs> um, this is a question I should have clarified this you said that a monkey only covers two or three miles in a lifetime but that a sick monkey must keep up with its group because there's little chance of the group coming back how can this be true if they're in three square miles well three square miles if it's bush and, bushes and forest is, is a big area and they frequently move much more in the daytime than the distance across the area. I mean, in a three square mile range, the monkeys might move seven or eight miles in a day, ending up in uh, any good tree, uh, usually near water, uh, in, in the range. So actually, there is a very good chance of being lost, uh, even at two or th 300 yards away. And uh, it doesn't mean that the animal inevitably will not get back to the troop. It does mean that it's much less likely to. Are non-human primates capable of love-hate emotions? <laughs> Would you please define emotion? Uh, <laughs> wish he'd stuck to the first question. Uh, well, uh, what you see in the primates, let me talk of the, of the external thing that you, that you see first, is marked individual preferences. That is, some monkeys go to other monkeys and sit by these other monkeys, groom these other monkeys. So you see clusters. Uh, three or four or five. And the same is true at Goodall's data and the chimpanzee, the same with Schaller's data uh, on the gorilla. In the uh, Japanese studies on the Japanese macaques and the studies in rhesus monkeys in Cayo Santiago Island, it is shown that some of these clusters are a mother and her children. So you have a cluster of four. It'll be a female, say, and three children, spaced roughly a year apart. And then a male or not may be added, an adult male or not may be added uh, to this kind of a group. What you need, so to speak, to convert this into a human family is simply to add a male on a more lasting uh, basis. But there's strong preference for the infants and their mother. And this is a lasting bond in these two cases where we have good information. Now, in the field studies where you obviously can't tell whether an infant really is this uh, female's child or not, you see the same kind of groups. And you see groups which are age graded. You see what looks like three-year-old, two-year-old, one-year-old, you see. So I think we're seeing uh, the, same, the same sort of thing. So the female bonds are, to the young are very strong. Uh, if the female dies, if the oldest young is female and old enough, she's middling juvenile, she takes on this role and her siblings stay with her, and she takes the role of mother and continues to groom and to take care, in this sense, of these other animals. So there are long-lasting, positive, affectional relationships between the animals. Uh, between males, you get these teams of, of ones that stay together. Some of these are probably siblings, but that uh, we're not sure of at, at the present time. Um, on definition of emotion, I mean, things are, are like rage, but things that you feel strongly about, uh, things that, that move you to action because of your uh, internal feelings. Uh, 
Why do animal societies have leaders? Well, um, uh, a very distinguished female anthropologist, and uh, I met her at a meeting a few years ago, and, and she said to me, uh, Sherry, have, have you read the book on the red deer? Have you read Darling's book? And I said, uh, yeah, sure, I've, I've read it. And she said, did you see who the leader was? And I said, you bet I did. It's the elderly female. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So uh, animal societies may have leaders, and, and they may not. And uh, uh, in monkeys, most of these monkeys in these small areas are going along routes which they know very well, where they've been on them before, and where it's exceedingly difficult to detect leadership, because the leader is not the first animal. What happens in the leadership, in this sense of the troop, is if they, say, come to a place where paths divide, if the lesser animals who are going first go the way that the dominant animals don't want to go, the dominant animals just go down the other way, and the lesser animals come back and reform the troop. It's sort of like a center of gravity, so to speak, moving in the middle rather than a leader at the end. I was first studying baboons. I saw a, a, a female leading the troop, running way ahead, climbing into a fruit tree, and I thought, gee, this is a very great change from what I'd read about monkeys, and I wrote down in my notes, female leads troop, and so on. Well, I found out later she was absolute bottom and dominance, the whole troop, and the, what was happening, she was running ahead to get in the fruit tree and get some fruit before she was chased out by the more dominant animals. <laughs> you stated that the hand evolved from the use of tools. How could a change of the hand uh, change the genes? Well, this, this is just speaking shorthand. It's very difficult when you're speaking about evolution to always say that what you're doing is stating that the successful behavior led certain individuals to survive, and this changed the gene frequencies, and therefore you have a, a changing gene frequency in terms of the successful behavior. In this case, the whole argument would be that those individuals which had larger thumbs due to their gene frequencies, in fact, could hold tools better, make better tools better, killed more animals, so on, got more food, their offspring survived better. This changed the gene frequency and led uh, uh, to the larger thumbs. Um, it, it's, we ought to have some other words, I think. It becomes terribly awkward to keep saying this. Normal English language makes you sound like a Lamarckian. <laughs> right? In regard to the term theory of evolution, I feel that the term species mutability to meet the demands of a changing environment in which all natural species is much more explanatory and practical than the term evolution, which is largely speculative, uh, would you care to comment? Well, the term evolution is, is a very general term, and I think it's an old term. It's worthwhile uh, using it. And it stood for many different things. I mean, it doesn't commit one to any particular thing. And I would like really to comment on the question of the word speculative. I, I don't think it is speculative. And particularly after the discovery of DNA, we know more now about the mechanism of evolution and what lies behind what we call genes without knowing uh, what they were th than ever before. So that to, it, it seems to me the notion that gene frequencies change through natural selection is something which is ex very well experimentally verified. And I would regard this as a uh, sound part of science. Now where the speculation comes in is applying these notions, say, to a particular group of fossils where you have a few beaten up bits of bone and you have all kinds of problems of making sure how the, a particular lineage should be interpreted. There's a great deal of speculation in that. But I don't regard evolution as, as a theory as, as a speculative matter. Would you suggest any educational models, techniques, or methods for developing the creative intuition of man? Well, we have a lot of such models. You know, this is one of the things that I, I think is, is discouraging. Um, it seems to me it's been known for a long time that uh, preschool playgroups, enriching the environments of, of children, uh, had a large effect on their creativity. And uh, uh, one thing that was pointed out to me, particularly by, by Jane Lancaster, relative to the uh, 
poor linguistic performance of many people coming from uh, the ghettos. Uh, look what happens in a middle class family. I mean, a child sits on the mother's lap and the mother reads the child and talks to the child, and there's a tremendous amount of verbal interchange. And it, the brain develops partially because of these things that are coming in from the outside. For example, the uh, fact whether the left or the right half of your brain has the speech center in it, this is true after about five years, as was described to us yesterday, but if either half, dominant or other, is removed early through tumor, very rare thing, fortunately, the other half will take over. In other words, here this dominance is due in part to, to experience. And it seems to me what, what is needed is enrichment in every sense of the life of these kids who are not now uh, having their lives enriched and much more study as to what kinds of enrichment are really worthwhile. One thing that's unique about man is the long time that he is developing. Uh, it takes us roughly twice as long to get to be mature as it does a chimpanzee. It takes a chimpanzee roughly twice as long as a monkey of the genus Cercopithecus. This is a long time then for learning. And this, in time past, a child in this situation could see all the adult activities that were important to his tribe. Uh, he could see the religious ceremonies, he heard the myths. Uh, the whole reality of adult life could impinge upon this growing child and he could then have the values, the abilities, the skills and so on that were necess for him, necessary for him in later life. In this sense, our best schools are highly impoverished schools because they do not offer the child anything like the chance that the child had in a hunting gathering society of 10,000 years ago. And this seems to me an extraordinary situation. The no notion that you can po postpone education to the first grade uh, is ridiculous. Let me give you one uh, experiment on rats. It was done by Kresch and Rosenzweig. It's part of a series of experiments. The rats are taken away from their mothers on day 21. It's weaning and then they're put in an impoverished environment or an enriched environment from a rat point of view. Well, <laughs> the enriched environment rats have a thicker cortex, more chemically active brains, and their IQ for rat IQ simply soars above what it is in the impoverished rats. Now, a rat has very little cortex. I mean, if you're going to guess where the environmental effect would be greater on a rat or a man, you'd guess that the environmental effect would be vastly greater upon uh, man. So in a sense, there's this dilemma. A uh, little monkey is very active, and it can determine the, its relation to its mother uh, pretty effectively. The human infant is to a much greater extent dependent upon its mother, and then in the house and so on, the things that are allowed for it. So the human child is potentially much more vulnerable to mistreatment or to impoverishment than is the case of the other primates. And if they get a good uh, enriched environment, this is to the benefit of mankind. If they get an impoverished environment, it's against uh, mankind. What is your reaction to the philosopher's reasoning? I think, therefore I am. Um, does this have any bearing today? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a philosopher at all, as you probably gathered. I, I, I think if you're thinking, you've got to be. I don't see any choice. <laughs> <laughs> what more specifically is the relation between tool making and language development? Well, uh, again, uh, Jane Lancaster, a student who's been working on this particular problem, um, she thinks that this tool making for a long, long period of time was the thing that caused very specific environmental reference, attention, and very specific instruction from one individual to another. I mean, either closely copying and so on, and that these would change the necessities of communication. Furthermore, the tools certainly changed the social situation. And this would, again, possibly uh, uh, help the beginning of language. What we're looking for is, is some kind of situation which emphasizes environment, and toolmaking uh, seems to do that.
Aren't there some canines which engage in cooperative hunting? Uh, well, wolves do, and, and uh, uh, African wild dogs do, and uh, you can have quite elaborate cooperating uh, in hunting. And uh, uh, I think this is really quite different from the, the situation in man. For example, both males and females are involved in, in the wild dog uh, hunting. And uh, I think I could summarize the situation this way. This is an old notion that human families are like wolf families, you know, and so on. That there's a division of labor in man. And human females do not go out and hunt and return to the den and regurgitate the meat for their young. 